Oh, manufacturing, that's right. I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, September 25th, 2018 City Council, and I'll call this meeting to order. Um, let's uh, start out with the Pledge of Allegiance, and uh, uh, Council President Menke will lead us in that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with 
this evening we're going to start with a uh, a proclamation and so i'll come down uh jody from medp if you'd come up and i'll do the proclamation and then i'll give you an opportunity to say a few words Thank if you. Uh, whereas manufacturing makes a very significant contributions to the national, state, and local economy, and whereas our community is fortunate to be the home of over 90 world-class manufacturing companies, and whereas those manufacturing companies add to the vitality, prosper prosperity of our community by employing over 3,400 people with a 15 million average annual pay, a 15 million average annual payroll. Now, therefore, I, Scott A. Hill, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of McMinnville, do hereby proclaim October the 5th, 2018, as McMinnville made in conjunction with the National Manufacturing Day. And in witness thereof, I have hereto set my hand and caused the official seal of the city of McMinnville to be affixed this, the 25th day of September, 2018, signed Scott A. Hill. Jody. Thank Thank Jody and her group do such good work, and uh, I'm sure she wants to share just a little bit of the vision and kind of some of the successes that we've had. So, Jody. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to thank you for once again proclaiming uh, National Manufacturing Day. It's an important day that supports our manufacturers here locally, but also nationally, to elevate the opportunities for youth and for others in the value that manufacturing brings to a community. Those jobs tend to have higher wages and more growth opportunity. So you to have a strong economic vitality in a community, you need to have a strong manufacturing base. That is proven over and over again, and McMinnville is very lucky to have that strong base here. So tonight I've provided you with some things that are McMinnville made. These were um, contracted. We went with Golden Valley Brew Pub. We had a designer create a label that specifically calls out the uh, competitive advantages of McMinnville as a community. We've had these for a year. Uh, we've given them out to site selectors, people visiting our community, development people, real estate uh, firms. Uh, we've given them out to the, everyone from the governor's office down. We want people to know that McMinnville is a great place to have a business and grow a business. So you'll see there's on the front is the what we call the exclamation point of Alpine Avenue, and that's Buchanan Cellars. We have a rich history in agriculture, but it's also a history of innovation. And so you'll see over the next year, we're going to be calling that out very intentionally. On the side uh, are the competitive advantages of McMinnville, and then on the other um, is the story of Peter who is one of the first brewmasters in the state of Oregon. He was one of the first 12. So we think that that is a really important story. And again, everything's McMinnville made. The other thing in the companion marketing piece was a piece done by our intern this last summer. And this is called Authentic City. We wanted to call out and define what it is to have a quality of life. And so these are stories and photographs of the elements that are unique to McMinnville that really define who we are as a community. We've also used this as a companion recruitment piece to show people that not only is it a great place to have a business because of the cost, but these are the people that you're going to be working with and be in our community. So we really are quite proud of both of those pieces. We will be honoring and celebrating our manufacturers at our annual awards banquet, and that is a lunch on October 12th. We hope you all can join us. We have some great surprises in line, and we are once again honoring several of our manufacturers. So thank you again for recognizing the importance of this sector and your continued support for our work and, and champions for the business community. Thank you. And as I would say, there's more to come. That's the exciting piece of it is we're going through uh, our strategic plan and we're having an opportunity to look at our focus on economic development, business development, and uh, 
what we want to look like in the future. So, uh, Jody, again, thank you. Uh, we are to that point in our present in our agenda this evening where we are going to take uh, comments from citizens. And so any interested individual that would like to address the council uh, can speak on any topic other than matters in litigation, uh, quasi-judicial land use matter, or a matter scheduled for a public hearing at some future date. Uh, we'll uh, have you limit your comments comment in, comments to three minutes and so I'll just uh, I've got a number of individuals that have filled out the public comment card and so Leanna would you come up first and introduce yourself and address the council just right up here thank you all I'm actually here today to address something that is obviously not in litigation, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Um, but I, I'd like to present this small piece of paper, um, if you will. Could I bring it up to you? So this is something I received from the postmaster at the post office. Um, I have this issue to address because it's been brought up by several residents of our ward. Um, it was actually brought up last year to um, our council members. And I've spoken to the postmaster here and in other cities. I know it's been an issue with other residents in other areas in our city, um, as well as other cities. Uh, but as we understand things, it's a federal crime to open anyone else's mail. It's also um, something that you won't tolerate the obstruction of someone receiving their mail. Uh, the U.S. Mail Delivery Service is um, set in every city to be able to deliver to residents in that city. Um, however, we've uh, approached a significant amount of missed mail delivery because our postal service workers can't get to the mailbox. There's a requirement previously that was 30 feet. Now, um, they said because of the vehicles that they have, they can um, turn on a 15 feet radius. So they, they actually need 15 feet on either side of the mailbox in order to um, accommodate that mail delivery. So what I'm asking um, is because the mail is being prevented from being delivered um, is, you know, the, the post office gives people flyers uh, to this flyer specifically to say that, that they can't deliver the mail for this reason because they're parked there. Um, but what I want to ask is why we aren't applying that simple fix. To assist our postal carriers, uh, we need to be able to enable them to do their job to deliver the mail. Uh, when people park in front of those mailboxes, uh, you know, the curbs could be easily painted with a caution uh, that we do we put out in fire in front of fire hydrants, which are used occasionally or in emergencies. But these mail carriers are delivering mail every day. So these mailboxes need to be cleared and unobstructed every day. So I'd like to consider this as a priority. If we aren't issuing fines for this parking, um, obstructing a federal post office delivery, then I would encourage our city council to seek a better solution. I would ask that we approach this and adopt an ordinance or perhaps pursue proper resolution to meet the needs of our residents now. I'm asking the questions to help bring the attentions, attention to the issue. Um, one that I believe falls under the responsibility of our city to enforce. And I appreciate hearing your thoughts on it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Leanna. Ooh, perfect timing. Yep. Um, again, thank you and uh, we'll... Absolutely. Uh, would you like me to We'll remain? just take the comment and then we'll follow up with staff. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Denise? Welcome. It's good to see you. Please state your name and you've, we've got your address. And okay. Denise Murphy. And I just came to thank the city council for passing ordinance 5053 back on June 12th of this year that pertained to the parking garage, which had been a mess for about two years. And thanks to Chief Scales drafting that initial ordinance and then you all providing guidance, 
and then voting to pass it, it is like an entirely different building. The tents are gone, the trash is gone, the bottles are gone. I can find a parking space because people aren't camping in them. And on top of that, I can whip into a space now without worrying that I'm going to run over somebody who's sleeping under a blanket. So again, just thank you. I know a lot of times out of sight, out of mind. It's been three months, but I appreciate every day that you will have solved this problem, that it's no longer a problem. So thank you. Thank you, Denise. Uh, Scott? Kind of funny. Hi, my name is Scott Thorkelson. I'm the manager of the Fastenal store in the industrial park. <clears throat> I sell industrial goods to the manufacturers, mostly in the industrial park. And so it's interesting, here it is, National Manufacturing Day, and we're honoring <laughs> them. And I am here to say, why don't we, I'm here to talk about the RV park. And as Grace was just saying, how fantastic is, it was, is that they are not there. Unfortunately, they are now in our beautiful industrial park. I work in the industrial park. I go by the free RV park six, seven times a day. I've put together about four little topics. I'm going to try to go through them quickly. First one is safety. Um, the spot that goes down in front of Mac, Water, and Light, that is one of the only two spots to get down to Joe Dancer Park. I can't tell you how many thousands of children are down at Joe Dancer Park playing. And with only two exits, I have sometimes seen 30, 40 cars lined up to get out. When I was going down to get to my children, there was a person coming off from the right to the left with a casserole dish. She was going from her RV to the, it wasn't an RV on the other side, but it was a structure that they were having a community gathering. She looked at me, I slammed on my brakes. She looked at me saying, what the heck are you doing? I, and I wanted to say to her, what are you doing? This is a public city. I'm trying to go to my son's cross country meet. Why are you bringing a casserole dish? Why do you feel so comfortable with a casserole dish to go across the street? When I came back up, I said, I wanted to document this and, and video it. And when I was doing that, the entire crew started saying, F you, F you. I've got it on my smartphone. If you would like to hear it, I'm sure you can figure out what they were saying to me. But I'm just going, Wow, you guys are that empowered. You are that strong. You are that brazen. Gutsy. All right, sanitation. Of course, you guys know there is no restrooms down there. I don't know where everyone peeing is. Someone told me that actually that's not even against the law. But if we shouldn't have people peeing outside. People have been down there for months, and there is no indication. When I talk to the police, and when they give a citation, they just say, put it on the pile because everyone knows they are not going to be towed. Nothing is going to happen to them, and it's a big joke. I don't even know why maybe we issue them anymore, because no one's going to do anything about it. That's why I feel I need to be here today, because as Grace was happy to have it out of the city, unfortunately now it's in the industrial park, and no one lives in the, in the industrial park. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you at 5 o'clock, when everyone goes home, when I go home, no one is back there. That goes to my third one on security. This is here because two days ago, this was kind of like the final uh, straw on the, on the donkey's back. This, my fuel line was cut in one of my work trucks, okay? This never happened before it was out. Before that, uh, I had a water issue where people would come up and take water. They would turn off my water to my company and fill up their RV tanks. Thirdly, it was interesting, like I said, I sell industrial supplies to the very people. Viesco Concrete came to me. I was putting up a sign saying, you know, security, even though I didn't have a security, I was putting up a sign that said, security cameras are watching you. He goes, I need four of those, I need 10 more, and I need huge signs to say, uh, danger, no trespassing. I'm going, whoa, you are freaking fired up. What's going on? He goes, I am sick and tired. I have a concrete tower that's maybe 50, 60 feet. Every night they come over, they think it's a jungle gym. They RV people. I can tell you, we just paid $25,000 for a new fence. I've been here for 19 years and he's telling this to me. I want to say, you should come with me tonight at seven o'clock and be telling you guys this. He goes, but no, 
I spent $25,000 to put a new fence around my facility because every single night they just walk across the field and take everything out of my stuff. And I am just so freaking tired. I thought this was going to be done. And who thinks this is a good idea? I think they said maybe a week or two weeks, but this is going on months and months. I said, I, I'm, it's crazy. I'm going to be going down there. I'll share your story. They should know. Um, we're getting close to our three minutes. Scott, okay. So Last one, I was talking to a police officer. He goes, it's too bad McMinnville now has the reputation of being homeless or gypsy friendly. I can tell you the same thing is that when Jody goes around and tours our beautiful industrial park and we still have lots of vacancies available or larger places, Jody is not proud of our RV park. I'm sure she, when she goes around and tours, she does not say, hey, let's go down Joe Dancer and let me show you this. No, she is skirting way over here and going over here and saying, don't you look at any of that. But I would just like to say reputation, image, and right now our image is that um, those RVs are, uh, have the most importance. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, last thing, a, a solution. I say, I just read Grapes of Wrath. <laughs> Why don't we go with a poor farm? Everyone has, uh, let's get some land out there. And if you, if you have an RV, uh, you work for an hour. If you need a tent, if you need food, we'll do it. We'll, we'll, you know, but we need to solve the problem. People need to take responsibility. If you don't have it, uh, we could even get the bus to say, we'll go out there every two or three times a week, a day, excuse me, you know, so we can get some uh, interaction. That's what I like to say. If you have any questions for me. Uh, it's just a comment time, so, but thank you, Scott, for bringing that to our attention, and uh, we're listening, and sorry about the cup fuel line. I, unfortunately, it was just, you know, fill out some paperwork, and yeah. we can't do anything. Yeah, so, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kyra? Kara. Excuse me. Welcome. So my name is Kira Barsati, and I'm a citizen here along with my husband. We raise two children who go to the McMinnville School District. I actually work for a local nonprofit where we uh, help families. We keep them, keep children safe and families together. Uh, my husband is actually a firefighter here in town. He's one of the, the few sitting behind you tonight. And he's worked for the city of McMinnville for about five years now, and he's been a firefighter for about a decade. I'm here because I was incredibly encouraged last week when Coin6 came to town and was doing a story on the, sh the staffing shortages at the fire station. And I understand that the news register ran a similar article or expanded upon that today. Um, I was excited because I, I've known for quite a while, living with a firefighter, being a wife and a citizen, I've known about these shortages and I've heard about them. Um, but I have to say that I was, I was disappointed I was disappointed because I felt like when my husband came home that evening that nothing was being done. The city has grown so much in the past decade, yet our public safety structure is stuck in the past. I know that you've heard the statistics many times from Chief Whiteford. I'm not here on behalf of any firefighters. This is me as a wife and a mother and a citizen of our city. The number of first responders or I should say, the number of first responders in our city has not increased since 2009. I know you all know this, I don't have to explain it to you. Yet the number of calls and incidents of businesses and tourism has increased steadily over that time. I don't know that many of our business owners or our citizens know that, and again, that's why I was encouraged. You've heard the facts, you know that there are inadequate, or you've heard from Chief Lightford about the inadequate staffing of fire stations, of personnel, of their ability to meet these demands. And I know that firsthand that our firefighters are burned out and exhausted. They're trying to meet unrealistic demands being put on our public safety system. And this is why there's high turnover. It doesn't have much to do with the fact that Portland and Clackamas and Tualatin Valley is hiring. Yes, that's true. But I know firsthand that it's because their home life and their health is being put at increased risks. And those that have left, because I've talked to them and I've talked to their wives and their husbands, it's because they can't continue to operate under these current conditions. In fact, they respond to so many calls that they're on track to run nearly 8,500 and 9,000 this year alone. Yet they still respond day after day because that's the oath they took. 
I have the utmost respect for all of you. My mother was actually a city councilwoman for 16 years in my hometown of Idaho, and I understand the demands put on you. But I know your obligation is to know the facts as reported by Chief Lightford. It's your responsibility to know and act diligently, diligently with these facts in mind. And as outlined as last week during your open session, our current model is not adequate for our community's size and needs. So my question is, what's come of your strategic plan with regards to EMS and fire, Stacey, fire safety, excuse me, and what are you doing now? Not five years from now, not looking at a public district. What are you doing now to stop the hemorrhaging across the street? Because I know it's having an impact. It has an impact of everybody sitting in the back of this room. And they need the support from you. They need you to listen. And they need you to do the right thing and act. Thank you. Thank you. OK, that now takes us to our consent agenda. And this evening, we have two items on our consent agenda. Uh, the first is the approval of the minutes from our July 10th work session and regular meeting and July 18th uh, city council work session. We also have under consideration an OLCC license request, a winery new outlet from the muddy um, uh, Frogwater Country LLC located at 323 uh, Southeast Baker Street. Is there any counselor that would request to have any items taken off the um, consent agenda and heard in the regular place on the agenda? Seeing none, I will ask for a motion. So move. Second. And a second. And, uh, uh, Kelly <coughs> has uh, moved and Sal has seconded. All in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, signify by saying nay. Um, we have uh, passed the consent agenda uh, five to, to zero this evening. Uh, that takes us to our first resolution this evening, which is resolution number 2018-53, a resolution approving the dedication of a right-of-way from city property for the construction of a portion of Northeast Yon Ranch Road. And Susan, if you'd come up and address uh, the, the council on this. Sure, Mayor and Council, this is a little bit of progress we have to report on the Northwest Neighborhood Park Project. Uh, as you all know, we went out for a bid over the summer and got a really high uh, responses that were out of our budget range. Um, but we were making progress in other ways, and that's the construction of Yon Ranch Road. And we need to dedicate the, just like any developer, we had to develop um, and build and construct and dedicate the road frontage there to serve the park. So this is a um, logistical piece of that. If I can also just give you another update about the project that this is associated with. Um, we have uh, retooled the design of the park and are going to go out for another neighborhood meeting in the next week or two to let them see the new plans and then we plan on going out to bid um, sometime in November uh, and hope to get a better uh, better economic situation for the responses to the RFP so thank you um, any um, any questions for Susan I do. go ahead yeah um, Susan thank you for that um, <clears throat> Is the, so the, the bids are coming in too high for our budget, is that right? They did over the summer, yes. We, yeah. we went out to bid, I think it was in June, and got them back. Uh, they, were, they were too high for our budget, based on the design at the time. Yeah, based on the design. So you're moderating that design, taking some of the high-end stuff out of it, possibly? And yes. We are looking at a couple of different scenarios. Um, and a couple of different ways of doing some of the grading on the site to save some money. We've re reduced some of the concrete on the site to save some money and just done some other um, tweaks to try and get within budget. Yeah. Yeah, th I think that park's important. Uh, there's been a lot of people in that area who have really participated in moving that along, citizens. Mm -hmm. And that they just want a nice open green space to be in, you know, so... Whatever it's a lot of worth. donations as well, a lot of um, contributions from folks and fundraising efforts to really move that park along, so we're yeah. excited to keep going. We're, we're still going. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Any other comments uh, from the council? Adam? I would just like to say that I know it's been a long time coming as a Kwanian. Uh, we've done a lot of fundraising over the years for this park, and I know that the overbids was discouraging to some of our member base, but... 
I think they'll be very excited to know that we made a little bit of headway. And um, of that redesign and retool, is, was any of that stuff like one off or just totally custom? Is Did that drive the cost up or was it just typical construction costs in this economy? You know, we really, with the design team and um, the maintenance staff, we really looked at a lot of that. We did find some things that we over-designed. So we had some patterns in some of the forever lawn surface that created some spatial separation. That added quite a bit of cost that we didn't know at the time um, based on the 16-foot wide rolls of the forever lawn. And so we've been able to have a, a lot, based on what the contractors responded with, we've been able to make a lot smarter choices. And then the, the second thing to that, uh, just lost it, but um, when do we anticipate to go out for rebid again? November, yeah. November, and so then soon. that would be construction at the spring season? You know, we are hoping to leave it a pretty open-ended timeline so that it can fit within someone's regular construction schedule. Um, we've been talking to different contractors and think that if we don't, we would put a pretty hard line on when the construction needed to be completed when we went out um, in the spring. And we think being more flexible about the timeline, we've been touching base with the granting agencies and others to make sure we can be a little more flexible. Um, so we're going to let the proposal, the idea is that we would let them tell us when they can complete it by, um, knowing that, you know, there's a, a reasonable window of two years-ish, um, but to get underway pretty quickly. So we're going to be more flexible when we go out and hope that'll end up in a better bid. And then last question, um, you talked about changing the grading style. Is that going to put us at any higher risk of, like, the, the substance that our parks being built on being not as long term or not not have longevity to hold up or the ground might settle differently or anything like that or are we still well, going to have a pretty yeah. stable park uh, foundation what i meant by that is we had a lot of different grading and elevation um we had we were moving a lot of earth in the original plan and that came in at a huge cost and so we've re-engineered some of it to make it a little flatter um, and we'll still be engineering to the same standards and, and making sure that we're doing everything we need to do to make it a safe park. Awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just one more question for me. Go ahead, Alan. Uh, Susan, on the grants, when do they expire? Can we count on those being available when we're ready to move forward on them? We yes. can. The state in particular has been very helpful, and uh, they're seeing the same problem we had all over the state. Um, and they've been very amenable to, as a matter of fact, they encouraged us to look at a They're the one of, one of the groups that said, go farther out in terms of your construction window so that you can get a better um, construction bid on that. So they've been very generous and very um, helpful. Just to get an idea of the, the gap that we need to close, uh, how, how much are we uh, off? When the bids came in, we were, uh, I think the lowest one was about a half a million dollars over what we had. What? Half a million. Mm -hmm. So we have about a $1.4 million budget for this park. So we were, we had a healthy design. All right. Got the challenge ahead of you then. Mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. We're going to do it, and yep. it's going to be an excellent neighborhood park, uh, and we are still focused on the um, accessibility and the inclusion piece of it, and it's going to be a really great neighborhood park. Yeah, I, I'm sure that the whole neighborhood would come out and participate with shovels and rakes if they had to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we'll look forward to that. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Any other comments? Hearing none, then I'll ask for a motion to approve resolution 2018-53. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> okay, it's been moved by uh, Adam and seconded by Alan. Um, uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed by saying nay. Five to zero, it passes. So resolution 2018-53 passes. Um, that takes us to uh, this evening uh, reports from counselors on committee and board assignments. And so I'm going to just move it uh, to, I'll start with Wendy and then we'll go Alan and then we'll go down to Adam and move up. Wendy? Okay. Um, I don't really have anything to report because we haven't had a meeting. So our first meeting, we our meeting was canceled for this month, and the uh, next meeting is the first Wednesday of next of okay. October. Alan, there's an affordable housing uh, task force meeting coming up. I think it's uh, tomorrow at ten. That may be true. Let me see here. Yes, that's it. Okay. Tomorrow at ten. Thank you. 
Adam? Um, Ycom, we met, uh, had a report from Patty on our new system coming online and nothing real crazy to report. We do have a, a module we'll probably have to pick up and uh, it's a module that only, out of all the users of Ycom, only the city of McMinnville utilizes that type of data download and it's re uh, related to our EMS system. So there's pretty uh, high usage of that and for efficiency, it will be something that needs to be picked up. But when TriTech bid our system, they didn't uh, notify us that it was going to be needed. So Patty's in negotiations with how much of that uh, YCOM or the city of McMinnville will actually be on the hook for. Um, she feels fairly confident she'll be able to get most of that comp. There's just going to be an ongoing service fee year after year for that technology. Um, other than that, everything at YCOM seems to be running pretty smooth with this new system coming online. I think they've been doing some load testing and uh, our initial go live date, uh, I believe was October 1st, but that's not gonna happen, hopefully by the end of the year. And uh, other than that, um, I don't know how, where you guys sat on the, uh, the work session we had last week, but I definitely think we need to do something for staffing levels before next physical year what that is or how we fund that. I don't have that answer, but um, I would like it to be top of mind for this council. Yeah, I think that work session was very uh, instructional and, and helpful bringing us up to speed on that. And and uh, I, I think we, you know, I've, I've shared with Jeff that we need to move and, and bring it back to a discussion level after the workshop. And we'll probably do that uh, on his return. Thank you. Sal? Yeah, I just uh, want to go on record as seconding that point of view. Adam, thank you for bringing that up. Um, uh, second point, the affordable housing task force meeting tomorrow had as part of its agenda a legislative concept that was put together by Chuck Darnell. Uh, just fair warning, there's uh, an important deadline for introducing legislation for the next legislative session, which is this Friday. Okay. So we need to get at least the concept um, and it can be a placeholder, but get that out the door if we want it considered um, in the upcoming legislative session. Thank you for that. And again, I think there'll be a number of us at that meeting tomorrow. Uh, Kelly? Uh, just briefly, I'd visit McMinnville. Uh, we're going full on uh, to let you know there's going to be a, a meeting uh, McMinnville is hosting of the Oregon DMO Association uh, December 3rd through 6th and uh, the Oregon uh, Transportation OTC or no Oregon Tourism Tourism yeah Oregon Tourism Council and uh, the Oregon DMO uh, group is going to be meeting at the same time great opportunity to show off McMinnville and all that uh, it can do um, we're focusing on a branding uh, effort and should get some results from that probably before the first of the year. So lots of things happening, a lot of good things on, with the visit McMinnville. And just one thing that I pulled away from that meeting was um, fiscally they're back on track where they need to be. Um, we really kind of, the way the funding happens with the tax going in there, we're a good two months, sometimes three months behind. And so they really did kind of a, a, a fiscal year end accountability and going the direction that the council would want them to be going. So um, uh, as they make their, as they make their, uh, um, presentation of the council, I think we'll be very pleased from that perspective. Yeah, things are much happier this year. I <laughs> um, uh, had an opportunity, uh, Kelly and I, to go to the Landscaping Review uh, Committee and, and uh, again, it's just a great opportunity to bring some very qualified committee pe people to the table looking at reviewing landscaping for uh, new building and replacement of trees that went r r well this month um, just to remind um, uh, Kelly and I will be headed tomorrow off to the League of Oregon Cities annual conference um, that will be held in Eugene uh, through Saturday and expect to we're involved in a lot of very, very uh, timely and uh, 
good meetings that are, uh, are going to be there. We're also receiving the safety award as a city. Um, we're aware of that. So um, a number of things from that front. Uh, Susan, again, you've had a, quite a bit of time to, to share with us today. Uh, I, I did make mention for those that came to our work session that we had um, uh, the opportunity to meet with uh, the school district earlier today under Susan and Mary Alice Russell's uh, direction to talk about KOB. And I think we've built a real strong communication and, and working relationship through the, that. So thank you for uh, moving forward and bringing all the parties to the table. I think we had representation from every uh, elementary school in the school district and we had a great dialogue. So anything else that you would have for us? I just want to mention that we've had a great volunteer effort over at Wartman Park. If anybody's been there recently, we had an Eagle Scout. Uh, Oliver, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his last name right, it's either Hedy or Hetty, um, oh, came out there. And, it is Oliver Hetty, yes. Yeah, came out there and did a fantastic job. Lynette Noble and I worked with him. He put new signs, got the signs built for free, uh, new signs for each tee box of the disc golf uh, course out there and put numbers on top of each of the baskets as well and really worked hard uh, you know hadn't played disc golf before and went out there and learned to play disc golf and embraced the project dug the holes for the signs and the poles and it looks amazing out there so uh, we're excited to let people know get back out there if you haven't played disc golf out there for a while it's looking fantastic and Oliver did a great job for us so we're excited about that great Melissa David Okay, with that, uh, I'll go ahead and adjourn our meeting. We are going to move into executive session under ORS 192- or dot 662, uh, 6602F to consider information or records that are exempt by law from public inspection. And so we'll go ahead and uh, uh, close this meeting and move into the conference room for executive session.